Welcome to Education Matters, presented by the Public School Forum of North Carolina. I'm your host, Marianne Wolf, and this week I will be joined by my co-host, Ashley Kazoo, the Associate Director of the Dudley Flood Center for Educational Equity and Opportunity at the Forum. Last week, the Forum hosted a town hall meeting to share thoughts about HB 324 and hear from educators, lawmakers, and students about how this bill affects them, and the importance of having critical conversations with students. HB 324 is a proposal to promote anti-discrimination in the classroom. This bill has also raised significant questions among some educators and students that the proposal will impact their ability to have conversations about race in the classroom. The town hall is intended to foster an informed dialogue between educators, students, and lawmakers so that we can all learn from one another's perspectives and ultimately enact policies that best serve students' abilities to experience a sound basic education in every classroom. With its nonpartisan vantage point, the forum recognized the importance of providing a space to discuss HB 324 with a specific focus on the voices of students, teachers, principals, and legislators in conversation with each other. How did your learning experiences or the lack of those opportunities impact you beyond the class and where you're going next. I had the privilege of taking two classes with Mr. Matt Sheldon, who you will also hear from. Um, those courses were African American Literature Honors and Hard History and Civic Engagement. And those courses were considered as electives at my school, meaning they were optional for students to take. Um, however, after taking both of them, I believe the content in those classes were actually essential and instrumental in why I'm sitting here today. Um, I learned historical points in those classes that I never heard in other classrooms. The point of these classes and in culturally responsive curriculum is not to sit and wallow in this oppression and struggle and negative energy, and then we're off to second period math. These classes were so unique in the fact that they were solution oriented, civic engagement orient oriented, and activism oriented. There was never a day where I felt like the world was weighing on my shoulders. I actually wanted to do something and I was encouraged to do something. That's why I'm here today. We cried, I will readily admit, like it wasn't lighthearted topics at all. We cried, we had uncomfortable silence, we had some tense moments, we had to challenge ourselves, but we learned. And every single person in that class walked in, ready to face those emotions. And by the end of that class, it was an overwhelmingly positive response, so much so that we begged for a second class and we got it. Um, which I've never heard of students wanting to take a second class of anything. When we talk about race in particular, as we look at this house bill um, or, or other subjects, when it comes to the marginalized peoples that, that exist here in North Carolina, and we know that to be true, um, teaching that history and laying the groundwork and, and providing foundations where students can feel comfortable having uncomfortable conversations that are emotional, but that help us to grow as leaders and, and future um, generations here in America, I think it's, it's crucial and important. And it's been very impactful in my life. And so as we continue to have that conversation, I think as someone who has gone through the public education system here in North Carolina and benefited greatly from it, some of my best experiences you know, Kayla mentioned activism. I got my start organizing in high school as well after the unfortunate Parkland school shooting. And that was because of my mentors and teachers inside that high school building that encouraged me to have those tough conversations, to become a leader, um, to be data and fact driven. And I think it's crucial that we continue um, to not only have those conversations, but to um, have curriculums and, and really a plan that allows us to really teach every student um, and allows every teacher to be prepared when it comes to these tough conversations because I think that's really where true learning occurs. What we mainly need to be concerned about is like how do you qualify discomfort? What does discomfort mean? What does guilt mean? Because when if someone wants to make a point that says I don't want to teach white students about slavery because they will feel guilty that their white ancestors held people enslaved. That's not a logical thought, especially for someone who is in high school. They're not going to feel that type of emotion for an ancestor that they had so many years removed. Um, and 
I think that honestly, more of the discomfort and more of that guilt comes when you don't know how to respond to situations with empathy and um, from an educated perspective, because you cannot have conversations that um, in that about critical race theory when you don't even know what that is and you don't know the history of slavery and you don't know the history of the middle passage and you don't know the history of the civil rights movement. Um, and it's going to be impossible to have um, relationships with students, other teachers, et cetera, if we don't, um, if we eliminate that from our curriculum. How has this bill and, and subsequent discussion helped you think about maybe it's reinforced or thought new things about the role of education in this society that we want to build. When I first read these words, um, the first thought I had in my head was which students are at the center of this concern? Um, because we could have already had an HB 324 when I was in elementary school and a classmate screamed he hated black people on my playground. We could have had this bill in middle school when N-word jokes and monkey jokes were like the funniest thing in the world. We could have had this bill when a Wake Forest high school student called a classmate um, an effing black piece of S. We could have had this bill when fourth graders were playing an escaping slavery game. We could have had this bill when a teacher in Apex compared a student to a slave. We could have had this bill when Latina students were harassed and bullied about their legality and if they had green cards after the 2016 election. The feelings of discomfort, guilt, anguish, and other forms of psychological distress could sound like a regular day to BIPOC students. It's been going on for years and years and years. And oftentimes those students are belittled, ignored, and gaslighted into believing that they are not real issues. So my question now is which students are at the center of this bill? Because given this political climate, given um, Senate Bill 3 in Texas that was just passed, given the outrage about critical race theory, given some comments by Republican legislators, um, worried about indoctrination in our schools without providing evidence of indoctrination in our schools, to me, it is very clear uh, that white students and white parents are at the center of this bill because there's just now a current movement of actually acknowledging and facing our country's history of oppression. And oppression is very hard to be impartial on because it is very two-sided. There is one side doing the oppression, there's another side doing being oppressed, oppressed. And there is a way to teach that without hurting feelings, without feeling discomfort um, in the long term. In the moment, it could be uncomfortable, but learning like a robot and trying to be impartial all of the time, A, is going to zone students out. They're already zoned out. The way that history is taught is detached from us and impartial with textbooks, but it's also not how you grow. You have to be confronted with outside information in order to grow. And so the language of this bill and what I believe would change if I read between the lines, what I'm reading is we want to maintain the status quo and the status quo is really just centering white students, white parents and their feelings. Um, it's nothing new that I see changing. It's simply doubling down on what is already occurring. Education to me is the first pillar in the equation of true change. And so when we talk about change and when we talk about positive change specifically, um, and again, looking to our future leaders, our, our current students um, to be the enforcers of that change, I think that education becomes critical. Um, and as Kayla mentioned, I think she made such a great point. She made many great points, but language um, is very, very key. And so when you talk about discomfort or anguish in this bill, when you just hear some of the things that are being mentioned um, nationally about the role of education, um, it, we, it really boils down to telling the truth. And I think that students are really good at that. And so I think the role of education to the point directly um, is one of teaching the truth. Um, it's one of preparing uh, those of us that are currently in education. And I think that we're all being educated constantly, but those of us that come, those that come behind us um, as to what is necessary to create communities that are welcoming, um, that really uplift the voices of all and allow each perspective of students to be shared. And so when you look at bills like HB 324 and others, um, you know, I have to admit to me, they are a bit troubling because it seems like we're trying to, to paint um, with a euphemistic brush 
the truth um, instead of getting to the heart of the matter. And so I think that, again, centering the voices of the most marginalized is key. Um, being able to go to those that have been directly impacted. I mean, I have grandparents that lived through segregation and to just hear them talk about the ways that people dismissed their concerns is, is troubling. And so I don't want us to do anything of that sort here in North Carolina, but across the nation. And so when you talk about education, again, I think it's the first step in creating change. Um, and I think we can all agree that change in one way or another is necessary. And so to give our students the tools to become the future leaders and current leaders that we are, um, the change makers that our state deserves, I think it's critical that we continue to center marginalized voices, that we continue, continue to host spaces such as this one where we can have these critical conversations, maybe even uncomfortable conversations, um, but we know that everyone is coming from a place of wanting to create a change and wanting to give opportunity and chances to thrive to the next generation. After the break, we will continue the conversation and hear from lawmakers and educators. Education Matters is brought to you each week in part by Town Bank, serving others, enriching lives. Based on the seven concepts that were established in HB 324 um, that shall not be promoted by public schools, what what historical areas, topics, movements, historical points, and or current events might be inherently um, prohibited from this discussion in classroom as a result of these seven concepts that should not be promoted in public schools? When I think about those concepts and what it may prohibit me potentially teaching in the classroom, I have to go to one of the most divisive or divisive, have you prefer to pronounce it, uh, events in the history of our country, which would be the Civil War. Would this bill, if passed, prohibit me from saying this in my classroom? Its foundations are laid, its cornerstone rests upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery, subordination to the superior race, is his natural condition. This, our new government, is the first in the history of the world based upon this great physical, philosophical, and moral truth. That's the cornerstone speech. Alexander Hamilton Stevens, Vice President of the Confederacy. So when you say, you know, concepts that promote, you know, one person feeling inferior to another person based upon their race or their gender or, or things of that nature, it makes me think, okay, maybe I can't talk about the cornerstone speech. Maybe I can't give people the real reason, you know, straight from the horse's mouth for the Civil War being fought for the Confederacy being formed, you know, would I be constrained to not talk about that? And if a student or a parent or family members feel bothered by that, because if I bring that into the classroom, trust and believe, I'm going to talk to my administrators beforehand, before I bring it into the classroom. As the only Black male K-12 through teacher in North Carolina who worked on the social studies standards and the unpacking documents, I know it's going to fit under the standards because I help write them. So it's going to be within the standards. And if I bring that to the classroom and someone feels uncomfortable or someone is bothered by it, I don't mean to be harsh, but that sounds like a personal problem. That sounds like something that that student or that parent, they need to reconcile amongst themselves because this is a historical truth. This is no fallacy. This is me not trying to to, to, to push any type of ideological agenda or political agenda. This is verbatim what this man said. And while I'm very, very happy to, to see our student voices, uh, these young men and young women who have articulated themselves so well this morning, I know all three of those students did not go to Halifax County schools where my students attend, where my children grew, are growing up, my biological children. And I think about Leandro, you know, so let's throw that in there too. Can I not talk about Leandro? Can I not talk about the, the, the demographics and the things that have been said in relation to that case in terms of, you know, the lack of action thereof upon the General Assembly? I was a sophomore in high school when that case was filed, you know? And so, you know, I look at these young men and young women talking today and I'm so happy and promised, but then I think about kids I talk who simply you know, don't have that gift or that talent or that skill to articulate how they feel. They get angry, and why? Because they don't have the resources that provides them with the educational structure that those young men and young women receive. So not only are you not providing the resources that they need to get an education of that type, 
but you're trying to restrain and constrain the voices and the expertise and the scholarship of teachers such as myself and my colleagues who are on the call this morning from teaching these historical truths. So I'm very bothered by that, very bothered by that. And I'm bothered by the fact that a lot of times these bills are being pushed by people who've never taught a day in their life. Uh, you know, if, if our BIPOC students can experience racism in our schools, then our white students can learn about racism in our schools. If one set of students is, is having to go through it themselves, another group of students could at the very least have a conversation about it. And the concept that discomfort should be removed from the educational process. To me, that is the moment where the most educational growth happens is a moment of discomfort. Ask any of us in the room, when we were first learning algebra, we were all frustrated and we were all uncomfortable and we pushed through it. I didn't entirely, but most of us pushed through it. Discomfort is a part of the learning process. And if we learn to get a little bit more comfortable with being uncomfortable, and maneuvering through those spaces together with the students in our class, then we can actually do something. Then we can lead to some real breakthrough moments of self-actualization for these kids. If HB 324 goes forward, then teachers are gonna be even more wary than they already are to help our students understand what's happening to them today. To me as a teacher, the idea of maneuvering a, a group of students through the year 2020, 2021, and to not make any mention to what happened over the past year and a half in our country and around the world, to not talk about George Floyd and the protests that followed, to not talk about the pandemic, to not talk about the election, to not talk about January 6th. To me, that is the equivalent of educational malpractice. One of the things that is so troubling with this bill is that it takes away the trust in the educator to be the facilitator, to show the children how to be proper historians, to seek the multiple perspectives, to, to gather the truth from those perspectives from the past uh, and to have those discussions. But uh, to expand upon that, I mean, there is not one decade in history that is untouched by this bill. Uh, HB 324 here, at best it's willful ignorance. And willful ignorance is dangerous alone when it's when creating policy because you can't truly create policy in true good faith without knowing the full scope of history and the atrocities that happen to every single American citizen. Uh, and then if you choose to censor certain events because of, of the role certain groups played, then you are right then showing to those students that being part, an ancestor of the marginalized group and currently marginalized, that your perspective is not as valid. Your, your perspective, your, your feelings are not as valid. And I think the, there's a lot of different repercussions from this bill. And it would change the narrative for a lot of the social studies teachers. And what I am also fearful on is that it would stop a lot of educators from, from teaching in North Carolina. It would stop a very, um, uh, I mean, look, if I wanna teach history and if I wanna teach truth and teach my students how to be historians, but knowing that I can't tell the truth in the full scope of these perspectives, then um, it would be hard to do that. If we're really concerned about our students, our students come first. It doesn't really, uh, how people feel, that's important, but every single student in that classroom matters. When you have 73% students of color, they matter. When you have LGBTQ students and they may be 7% of your population, they matter. We need to train teachers and every person who works with students to respect them and affirm them. But part of that demands that the history be known. I think there's a way, and this comes into training, that we train teachers to deliver material in a way that a child isn't shamed, that a child isn't humiliated. It doesn't matter what group did what. What matters is that they're taught the history and how do we make responsible, moral, 
logical choices in the future so that we don't repeat history. We've got to teach children proper history. We've got to teach them proper civics. We've got to teach them how to be upstanding citizens in a society and to understand and respect and acknowledge all the various people in the society. And so I think one, when I look at this bill, the quelling effect upon teachers that they just can't teach with liberty at something that they are experts at. Um, I saw a statistic that behind engineers, education has the most highly educated workforce. We are extreme experts. And it's saying that they don't know what they're doing. Why not trust them to do what they know how to do? We will continue this discussion after the break. Are there any questions that our representatives or Senator has that they would like to um, ask our educators that are here right now? I support almost everything I'm hearing. Uh, and when I say that, I mean anything, uh, I'll go to Rodney, I'll go to you. You mentioned about concerns about what you can teach, what you can't teach, quoting historical figures from the past. And I'll, you can teach any and all of that. Uh, we actually need more of that being taught so we don't go back and repeat our past. Uh, I, I like the idea that the focus on North Carolina history. I deeply appreciate that. And don't, don't read past the language of the law. We're simply about, promote, about promoting things that are inherently bad for the future of this state and for the future of this country. So anything that's ha happened in the past, you can teach it. You can teach it so our kids will most definitely understand it was bad. And also bear in mind, a lot of this comes from constituents. If y'all have a view, believe it or not, there may be other people that have views differing from you. And my job is to how do we collectively get the best for the most and have a good solid outcome. And in this effort, we have to have that solid outcome because we're dealing with our kids in the future of North Carolina. And I thoroughly understand that. I want to um, further emphasize and clarify a point that Representative Torbett's making. I, I believe you see a, a different bill in 324 in the Senate versus the House. And it clarifies that um, you can teach the good and bad parts of history um, it also goes on when it talks about promote. Um, I, I want to be very clear in here. It says promote with the legal definition of compelling a student to believe a certain thing. So, Matt, you said that to your knowledge, no teacher was doing this. Um, I would go further in my question to you in all of the years of experience that you've been teaching, do you have any knowledge where a teacher with the intent to compel a student to believe that they needed to go overthrow the government, do you have any knowledge of that occurring? I have never once heard of that happening in my 20 years of education. If, if we could compel students to do exactly what we wanted them to do and to believe exactly what we wanted them to think, we would probably start with things like compelling them to get to class on time every day. I do not think that I, I, I don't think so highly of myself that I believe that I can rewire a child's brain. All boils down to, we believe in our public schools and our public school educators we believe every single child in North Carolina deserves our best. And we invest in our public school educators and our public school children. Period, end of story. We take away barriers. We do not distract them. And we trust them if ever there was a time where we ought to be focused in education, on what matters, which is outcomes for kids. It is now. Thank you for taking the time with us to learn and think about education. That's all for today, and we'll see you next week.